Welcome everybody to today's program, Sunflowers and Starry Nights Inside the Genius of Vincent Van Gogh. Today we are hosting Jane O'Neill from Culturally Curious. This is all part of the European art series and I know people are floating in, so we'll take a minute to let them all in. Um, again, thank you for joining. We've got um, several more programs in the series, including European art uh, once again in February, starting February, what is it, 5th, is that correct? Yes, yeah, Sunday, February 5th from 3 to 4.15. It's going to be European art series, sacred symbols and devilish um, details, Northern Renaissance paintings. So Marnie, as always, as co-host, thank you, Marnie. She will be putting that in the chat um, just as soon as um, people roll in and sometime during the program. Um, I'd like to remind people, you're probably tired of hearing me say this for everybody who's been part of all of the programs. We ask people to stay muted during the program if possible. This helps us to keep focused and keep our focused on what Jane is saying, as well as allow the people to um, um, hear as, as best as we can. Um, once uh, the program comes to its um, tail end, we usually open it up for people to ask questions. So you can either use the raise your hand button and we will acknowledge you. Or if you see um, a free moment in there, excuse me, just uh, reach in and um, ask your question and change is always very courteous and um, helpful in answering all of our questions. So for people who are just coming in, welcome Sunflowers and Starry Nights Inside the Genius of Van Gogh. Today, this is a collaboration with the Rockport Library as well as many other libraries um, throughout the state. I specifically would like to thank the Friends of the Rockport Library for sponsoring as well, as well as all of the other friends groups and libraries. Um, I am Dana Mastriani from the Rockport Library. And uh, once again, for those just entering, if you could please keep muted during the program and uh, we will open things up for questions at the tail end. Um, Van Gogh seems to be a very, very curious um, uh, a uh, person in that everybody seems to have an interest in learning more about him. I don't know if it's the situation with the ear. I don't, I'm sure it, um, Jane is going to touch on that. I'm sure um, it, it has something to do with it. Maybe his colors and his way of producing art is something that's of great interest to people. Um, but I think it's something different for all of us, yet I think there's something universal universal that takes us all in on his artwork. So what I will do now is introduce the program and Jane and thank everybody for coming. Um, we have the European art series, Sunflowers and Starry Nights. Um, this is part of the continuing European art series through Culturally Curious and Jane O'Neill. Vincent van Gogh, one of the world's most famous artists. This is an interactive program which will look at his life and work, experience, exploring his influences, his innovations, and his incredible legacy. A little bit about our presenter, Jane O'Neill. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston is a place that she worked as well as several other places. Um, she has an art history uh, degree from Boston University, as well as a master's in education from Harvard University Graduate School of Education. So I'm gonna turn things over to Jane. A huge um, shout out to everybody thanking Marnie for co-hosting with me. And um, we are recording this and we'll make the um, recording available probably within the week to 10 days of the completion of, of the um, program today. So thank you, Jane, and thank everybody for joining. It's such a pleasure to be here with everybody right now. Thank you, Dana, and thank you everybody for taking time out of your day to learn a little bit more about Vincent van Gogh. How lucky are we that we'll have essentially like our own private tour of Vincent van Gogh's life and work over the next hour or so. And hopefully you're doing this from the comfort of your couch or your kitchen table. And um, 
you know, enjoying a glass of wine or something nice like that. Uh, this will be a lovely way to spend your Sunday afternoon. So we will, of course, be talking about this incredible painting on the screen a little bit later, but I wanted to give you a sense in terms of how we'll spend this next hour together. So here's our program overview. We're going to start off with an introduction to Vincent van Gogh. It's going to be pretty brief because we only have an hour together. We're going to turn our attention then to this category of post-impressionism. That's um, how he is... Um, understood today as a to be a post-impressionist artist. What does that really mean? I'm going to break it down for you and then review just a few of his artistic influences. And then instead of walking you through chronologically his life, I wanted to walk you through the different types of paintings that he created. So um, there, the different categories, including still lifes and landscapes. So we'll, we'll touch on, I, I'm sure, all of your favorites. <laughs> and then we will circle back. I'm going to leave you hanging till the very end to the the famous story of the year. What actually happened there? There's a actually a, a more than one theory out there and even more than one theory about his demise. So lots to cover. Um, We'll be looking at this uh, self-portrait a little bit later, but it is a fascinating one. And I think a great transition from Starry Night too, because we can see all those same kind of swirls in the background here. But let's get started with our introduction to Vincent van Gogh. Here he is on the left in an authenticated photograph of the artist from around the age of 19, and then a self-portrait painted on cardboard when he was about 34 years old. Now, Vincent van Gogh was born in 1853, so right around the middle of the 19th century. And, um, and other than his several dozen or so self-portraits, we really don't know what he looked like. There's only one or two uh, authenticated photographs of him out there, but we do know this is how he looked as, you know, on the cusp of adulthood, really. Uh, he had just gotten a job working for a, an art dealer when this photograph was taken. What we will see is that his likeness changes quite a bit as, um, as he goes through this process of, of painting himself. Now, uh, let's start off with some of the basics here. Vincent van Gogh, of course, was, was Dutch, but he lived most of his adult life, his professional career as an artist in France. He came from an upper middle class background. And, um, and despite that, he really sort of chose a, a, a very simple lifestyle for most of his life. We'll touch on that in just a moment. Uh, he went through a, a couple of different kinds of jobs, including art, being an art dealer and, um, and working in the church before landing on on becoming an artist. So he didn't find his way to art until he was 27 years old. And then he um, passes away at, at the uh, tragically young age of 37. So that's really only a decade where he's working. And during that time, he produces 900 oil paintings and over 1,100 works on paper. So he is just cranking things out. And I think we would agree that, uh, that a large number of them are, are really like masters works. He was, um, it, he was prolific, but he was not financially successful in, in this endeavor. In fact, it is true that he only ever sold one painting during his lifetime. So, you know, don't, don't keep anything um, from, from letting you pursue your dream. If Vincent van Gogh could only sell one painting, but now be, you know, worldwide phenomenon, keep plugging away at what you love to. This is his painting that he was able to sell and I don't think for any of us, it would necessarily be the one that we would choose. It's called the Red Vineyard from 1888. And like so many young artists, he sold it to a friend for the equivalent of uh, about $2,000 in today's bunny. Now, I mentioned before that he, um, he, he liked simple living and he was also, uh, he also uh, sort of attempted a career in the church. He served as a missionary for a brief time when he was a young man. That brings us to this image um, of Vincent's bedroom. This is from 1889. I think it's a familiar image to a lot of people. There's like this wonderful distortion in the room. You almost feel like the furniture could get up and move away. But I want to, um, I want to emphasize how sparsely furnished this room is, how few possessions Vincent Van Gogh had. And just to give you a sense of, um, of how, how, how much he desired this kind of simple aesthetic and, and, and simple approach to living, 
when he was serving as a missionary, he was given room and board to do that work. I think it was like above a baker shop. And he was supposed to go out and, and, um, and proselytize and, and, um, and convert people. But instead of doing that work, he wanted to serve people. And he actually gave his lodgings to a homeless man and chose for himself to essentially sleep on a pile of hay in a barn. So, um, so this is, this is the, the height of living in a little room like this. So he, um, he prefers this kind of monastic lifestyle. It's, I, I think in, in so many ways, it was, it was sort of what he could handle, but poverty marks his entire life. And we'll talk about how he manages to survive. Now let's turn our attention to um, Vincent van Gogh, uh, the person uh, and, and his, his sort of interior life here. This is a self-portrait also from around the age of, of 34 um, and uh, sort of a penetrating gaze here. <laughs> now we're going in deep. Now, Vincent van Gogh spent most of his life very lonely. He did actually propose to three different women, and he was rebuffed in, in each, in, by each of them. You could say his only requited love was art, but he, um, he was somebody who I think longed for connection. We do know that he kept the company of prostitutes, but he never really found the, the love interest of his life. So um, during his life, he was really seen as a failure and he was certainly seen as a madman. He had um, really unusual habits. And um, and I, I also want to make clear that in addition to all of his sort of um, extreme behavior, he did spend about a year in an insane asylum. And we're go I'm going to be referencing this uh, along the way, this time in the asylum, because it was um, really uh, the year just before the end of his life. And, um, and we'll see that he was productive even while he was there. Now, it's never easy to diagnose somebody after they've died. There's all these different theories in terms of what he had. Had. Maybe he had manic depression. Some people think he might have had epilepsy, um, maybe a schizophrenia, which might uh, account for auditory hallucinations and then the mutilation of his ear. Um, but he certainly had uh, venereal diseases, having kept the, co the company of many prostitutes, <laughs> that, that might have impacted his mental health too. Now, when things got bad for his mental health, they got very bad. Um, and he was known to sometimes even ingest his paints and his paint thinner. Uh, he did not take care of himself beyond that. Vincent van Gogh was a man who... Um, who rarely ate. <laughs> he could go for six months or longer without eating a hot meal. He drank a lot of alcohol and he smoked. In this portrait of Vincent van Gogh by the artist Toulouse-Lautrec, you can see him sitting with a glass of absinthe in, in front of him. And absinthe was, of course, um, this very popular, very powerful liqueur that was said to have hallucinogenic properties. Essentially, if you were drinking absinthe, you were one step away from being blackout out drunk. You were in a, a, a drunken stupor. And I find it so interesting that he had a, a friendly sort of acquaintanceship with, uh, with the artist here, Toulouse-Lautrec, but it, it, uh, he's turning his head almost as far away as, as possible while this portrait is, is being rendered of him. He, in so many ways, feels unknowable. So if he wasn't taking care of himself, if he was so poor, how did he survive? Who was taking care of him? Well, the answer is his brother. And I'm going to refer to his brother using the sort of uh, Americanized uh, uh, pronunciation of it, which is Theo, Theo Van Gogh. Um, he was his life life uh, line and lifetime supporter. Uh, he was his best friend. He provided financial support and he was always, almost always there for him, I should say, in terms of, of times of crisis. Now, I, I love these two kind of uh, corresponding portraits because it turns out that, that Theo ended up working up, working for that same art dealer and, um, and made a career out of it. Now, even if the, the two men weren't in close proximity, they were writing to each other all the time. Vincent van Gogh never kept a scrap of paper that his brother Theo sent him, but Theo 
kept everything, 600 pages of letters from his brother, Vincent. And the letters, of course, have drawings on them. The letters sort of explain what he's doing, what he's thinking, what he's feeling, the whole thought process behind masterworks that he's uh, created that the world now reveres. And so these letters really function as a diary in so many ways. Um, over here on the left is a letter from 1882. This one over on the right is from eight years later. And you can really see a dramatic evolution in the style here too. So we get a sense that Vincent van Gogh was somebody who was living on the edge. He was sort of being propped up by his, by his younger brother here. Um, and, uh, and now we're going to turn our attention to exactly what this means, this, this idea of being a post-impressionist artist. How does Vincent van Gogh really fit in there? Because in so many ways, isn't he just a, an artist unto himself? Nobody else really paints like Vincent van Gogh, right? Well, yes and no. Let's see how this all works out. So the term post-impressionism, of course, is in reference to the term impressionism. So let's just get grounded in both of these terms briefly. Over here on the left, we have a painting by the impressionist artist Claude Monet. And on the right, we have an example of a post-impressionist work by the artist Surat. So uh, impressionism, of course, comes first. And it's, a, a, it's an artistic style that's marked by its rapid execution with the artist usually working outside or on plein air, attempting to capture momentary effects of light and shadow. It has a sketch-like un finished quality to it. Um, in, in many ways, you don't see the finer elements, the finer details in a picture, like blades of grass, but you can see um, broken visible brushstrokes, like in the, the leaves of the trees over here. I think the tree trunk on the far left over here is a great way to sort of see how these Impressionist artists were really interested in light and shadow. So, Monet and others are working in the late 1860s, the early 1870s, and eventually this revolutionary style really takes hold, but you have the, the next generation of artists who are interested in it, who are working within the, 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 the same vein, but they wanted to make something that was more permanent. In fact, there were even a few post-impressionist artists who, um, who thought, how do you teach this at a college? Like, we need to, we need to have some structure to this. And Seurat, over here on the right is nothing but structure. So he decides his approach to impressionism as a post-impressionist, although he didn't call himself that, would be to uh, very carefully and methodically place paint on his canvas. So it's not going to be a loose, rapidly executed work that is done in an afternoon. Instead, he spends months, if not years, on his painting, applying little dots of paint like pixels on a screen. Now, um, so, so you know, the whole process and the approach here is, is so different. But one of the big guiding principles for post-impressionist artists was this idea of color theory. And color theory basically boils down to the idea that if you put two colors that are opposite each other on the color wheel next to each other in a painting, especially if they're unblended, then uh, they will, uh, essentially the way our eye and our brains perceive them is that they will be more vivid and more vibrant. So many post Impressionist artists, Van Gogh included, are very interested in color theory. And I think you can really see this at play in Seurat's painting, uh, particularly around this painted frame that he created. If we look right down here in the foreground, there's this little stretch of um, like a violet frame where he's painted it, uh, this deep purple. And you can see that it's directly in response to this kind of peach patch of grass there. So he's, he's kind of working within this vein. And you can see it throughout the painting if you wanted to spend an afternoon with the afternoon on the Grand Jatte, which is the title of this painting. So let's turn our attention now to, to sort of see how, how post-impressionist looks when we're looking through the lens of Vincent van Gogh. We've got another impressionist painting by Claude Monet on the left, Vincent van Gogh over here on the right. Claude Monet is just applying these loose, fluffy uh, 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 brush strokes to everything in this painting, whether it's clouds, whether it's grass, whether it's flowers. We've got another garden scene over here, but you can see how intentional Vincent van Gogh is in terms of his application of paint. Just look at, train your eye on, um, on just like the, this dark, 
dark maroon color uh, that he is taking our eye down this path here. And he's using these very short, uh, very specific, very intentional brush strokes to do that. He changes his brush strokes according to whatever flower he's painting. Um, so he's changing color, he's changing brush strokes, but you can see uh, essentially as you move down this, this bed of flowers here over to the tree and the rock wall, um, he is, uh, he's being very careful and very controlled in his brushwork, but, but changing it according to what he is painting. And he's, like I said, purposeful all along. Let's also consider for a moment um, other artistic influences for an artist like Vincent van Gogh. Um, like the Impressionist artists, uh, Vincent van Gogh and other post-Impressionists were very interested in Japanese art. Uh, Japanese woodblock prints uh, were essentially flooding <laughs> uh, uh, Parisian society, fr uh, French society in the later part of the 19th century. So, so images like this would have felt novel, but they would have been nearly everywhere. And they certainly inspired works uh, by, by Claude Monet. Many of you have probably seen this portrait of Claude Monet's wife that I believe is at the MFA in Boston. Uh, the same is true for Vincent van Gogh. He saw these types of prints and they sort of galvanized him. To him, this was a completely different way of picturing the world. He would have seen something similar to this with like the stick branches stretching out from an unseen trunk across a, a you know, essentially a, a, a field of color. And that would probably inspired his almond blossoms that I think are a favorite for many over here from 1890. So we can see uh, that element sort of creeping into his work uh, throughout. And we'll also see little uh, touches of his uh, collections of Japanese prints throughout today's program too. But one last note, sort of circling back to that subject of absinthe, the idea that that being kind of blind drunk is also an influence for Vincent van Gogh. It was a part of the lives of so many of the Impressionist artists. This is an Impressionist painting over here by Edgar Degas called The Absinthe or The Absinthe Drinkers from 1875. And just a little more than a decade later, you have Vincent van Gogh, who's essentially describing the same thing with his world famous painting, The Night Cafe, which is at the Yale University Art Gallery. Instead of of simply trying to describe people in a drunken stupor, Vincent van Gogh gives us the experience of being in that stupor. We are in this room full of blindly clashing colors. Uh, it Everything seems garish, bright, harsh. We see all these people huddled over their drinks. We notice that it's just after midnight. It almost seems like the aura, the glow from these lights here, our eyeballs themselves that are looking at us. There's this sense of distortion and alienation here that is very unsettling. And certainly the fact that he was um, drinking absinthe in addition to the poor diet, in addition to the, um, the mental illness, all of these things were sort of coming together to inform paintings like this. So now let's dive a little bit deeper into Vincent van Gogh specifically. We're going to get into these different categories of subjects that he was really kind of moved by. And it starts off with peasants, farmers, and work. And this is kind of a natural shift for him because he had started off as a missionary and he was so interested in the plight of the poor. Uh, this was what really um, fed his soul. Uh, if not the mission work, then at least um, um, connecting with and, um, and being really well aware of, of the struggle of, of the less fortunate. And so uh, uh, peasants became really his number one uh, subject when, when he first launches himself. So one of the things that's important to know about Vincent van Gogh is that as an artist, he was almost entirely self-taught. And one of the ways he learned to paint was by copying prints. And he particularly loved the prints of this artist over here named Jean-Francois Millet. He was a French artist who was really popular right around mid-century. So when Vincent van Gogh was being born, uh, Millet was creating these scenes, these realist scenes or Barbizon school scenes of 
poor peasants, of farmers. Um, in this case, this is his monumental painting of a, a, a farmer who is sowing seeds. You can see this is his seed bag. These are the seeds in his hands as he's striding down this hill. So this is something that Vincent van Gogh copied directly as part of his training, part of his education, part of his practice. But we can see that his version of the sower, even though the subject he sort of gravitates towards, his reinterpretation is really all about color theory here. So we've got um, th this kind of gorgeous lemon lime yellow that's happening in the background and it kind of mixes with these beautiful purples and periwinkles and lavenders here. And of course, everything is animated, maybe you could even say agitated by these short visible brush strokes, these broken brush strokes. He's not trying to hide them. He's not trying to blend them. They are a part of the experience of the painting. Vincent van Gogh painted uh, so many different farmers, so many different sewers. They actually appear in his work 30 different times. This is, like I said, a subject that he really gravitated towards. Um, Oftentimes you see that it is really nothing more than an opportunity for him to explore color theory. So in this case, uh, the, the, the land is purple and the figure is, is orange. And, and, and we see in this case, the, the land is purple. And, and then we have this kind of orange and, and bright yellow sky in the background. Van Gogh is always kind of interested in celestial events. So we've got this lovely sower over here with this almost halo of a sun behind him. We have more uh, uh, encroaching Japanese influence here too with the strong diagonal of this uh, tree trunk that we see almost in silhouette as well. He's being really playful with these colors. I would call them anti-naturalistic colors. They have nothing to do with observed reality. They are an exploration of color theory, of trying to make a, a visually interesting picture where the color really pop. Now here is another painting by Jean-Francois Millet that I can't imagine wasn't influential to Vincent van Gogh. This is a painting called The Gleaners from 1857 and it's a picture of three women who are going through a harvested field and picking up the scraps by hand. Backbreaking work. I always get sympathy back pain every time I see this picture. And, uh, and this is essentially what, what Vincent van Gogh explored again and again in the early years of his career, women, almost always women, who are hunched over working the land, oftentimes they're harvesting potatoes, but they are, they're folded over themselves. They're doing this work that is so difficult and, um, and, and, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's dignity in this work, but there's certainly, there's certainly no fanfare in this work. It's, it's, uh, it's such humble work. And that's really what leads us to what's known as Vincent van Gogh's first masterpiece. Now, it's amazing to think of this as his first masterpiece for so many reasons. I'll start off with just the date. It is 1885. He is halfway through his 10 decade or his 10 year long career. And, um, and here we've reached his first masterpiece and it doesn't even look like a signature Vincent van Gogh. We haven't even arrived there yet. So you can imagine that first five years that he was painting, he didn't have a lot of success. It's really a five year long career that we're dealing with. And master piece. I, I don't think a lot of people would necessarily write home about the potato eaters that we're looking at here. I don't think this one really makes your heart sing in the same way that, say, Starry Night does. But, um, but he is exploring important topics that are very near and dear to his soul. At his, at, at his core, Vincent van Gogh was a humanitarian, and he was so concerned with the plight of the poor. So the potato eaters are poor people who've har harvested these potatoes themselves. They're sitting down at the the evening, there's a single source of light, but we do have a reference to a religious painting on the wall. And so sort of like Christ at the Last Supper, <laughs> we sort of get the sense of them sharing this humble yet almost holy meal. Vincent van Gogh purposely made these people look coarse, make the, made them look um, ugly. <laughs> There's, uh, he's not trying to romanticize their lives through their physiognomy here, which I think makes this kind of a tough painting to look at in addition to the fact that it's such 
dark colors. There's um, there's a there's a, a sense of dread almost when you look at at such a, a, a dingy, dreary painting here. But of course, we know that things are going to change for him pretty quickly. Well, I will end with peasants and farmers on on one sort of wistful, slightly happier note. <laughs> Here's one last uh, uh, version of Vincent Van Gogh copying from work from the work of of Millet. This is a, a, a drawing from Millet called the first steps. So we see a farmer who has dropped his uh, shovel or tool here so that his wife and his little toddler can come out and, and he can receive the, the, the baby here who's taking his first steps. How poignant that Vincent van Gogh, who had proposed to three women, who had never become a father himself, uh, reinterprets this work, this very special moment in a young family's life. And he uses these bright colors here. It's such a shift from the potato eaters. And I just love, it, it almost feels like curly hair, the way he's animated these leaves in the background with that kind of repetitive um, sort of swirling motion. So it's, it's, a, it's a poignant scene. It always sort of um, uh, pulls at my heartstrings when, when I see this particular work from him. So now we're going to get into sort of more traditional subjects uh, when it comes to Vincent van Gogh. And we'll see that there's a, a, a little bit of his background as a Dutch artist uh, bleeding into some of these categories. So as a Dutch artist, he would have been really familiar with Dutch traditions in painting. And the Dutch for centuries, this was an area that they really shined in. <laughs> so uh, back in the Dutch Baroque in the 1600s, this was um, the still life painting was uh, was was uh, I well I can't emphasize it enough it was really the best <laughs> in the Netherlands and and, um, and so this is a tradition that Vincent van Gogh would have been aware of the desire to create an image where you feel like you could reach in and turn a page or pick up the bread and taste it or drink the water or over here with a floral still life the the feeling that you could reach in and and smell one of these peonies or touch one of these grapes uh, these are paintings that are done with this kind of hyper realism a real tactile quality to them. Well, Vincent van Gogh, of course, never achieves this kind of realism in his paintings, but I think one of his earliest attempts at still life painting here uh, from 1884 shows that he's thinking of this Dutch tradition, if not for the very reason that he's included wooden shoes here. He's sort of thinking, you know, what what would uh what what would my predecessors have painted? It's a dark composition. It's a simple composition. He is in no way kind of attaining this level of detail that we see over here, but um, but he's thinking about those traditions, which I think is important. And still life becomes floral still life in particular becomes a sort of a favorite expression of his. This is called um, Base with Honesty from 1884 to 1885. Once once again, he's not mastering the details, but he's getting a really good sense of composition through experimenting with floral still lifes. And we'll see that he begins to really uh, uh, sort of solidify his, uh, his color choices and his approach to kind of ab uh, actually laying paint on canvas. So what happens here is we see this new infusion of color. This is really just on the heels of the potato eaters. We've gone from something that's so dark and so dreary to something that's really remarkably pleasing to the eye. What has changed here? Well, for Vincent van Gogh, everything. He has moved in with his brother. They're living together in Paris. There is more emotional and financial support in his life than he has experienced really since he left home as a young man. And so he's able to really thrive. Plus his brother's in has a career in the art market. So he's literally meeting people, rubbing elbows with all these important artists. And we can see this kind of bubbling up in his work, but these don't necessarily look like signature Van Gogh work. But as he continues to move along with these floral still lifes, and I should mention, floral still lifes are a really wonderful kind of cheap way for an artist to work because you don't have to hire a model. All you have to do is buy a bouquet of flowers. With these two works here, you can see him really experimenting with those brush strokes in the background, particularly over here, you almost get like a cross hatching happening. Um, 
but he's kind of finding his way through this. And then of course he lands on the solution of the sunflowers. Every time I transition from that slide to the sunflowers, I sort of get goosebumps. <laughs> you can see that he has found a solution here. And it is just so satisfying to see that progress and to see it kind of lock in like this. Now, between December 1887 and January 1888, he painted 12 different versions of the sunflowers. Of course, we're only looking at three here. And, um, and some of them uh, are expressions of the color theory that we talked about before. A lot of them show sunflowers from kind of bud to blossom to decay. But I think what's so appealing about about all of these paintings is that he really animates the sunflowers. He gives every single petal a sense of its own life. And it's just so appropriate too, because that's what sunflowers are like. We know of sunflowers, it's you know, rotating to follow the sun. They're, they have this liveliness to them already. And these colors, let's talk about these colors. Not all of these paintings are about color theory. Some of these are really experiments in creating almost an entire picture with just one color. I mean, this is a yellow painting. Vincent van Gogh knew that he had hit on something really special here. And he wrote to his brother, the sunflower is mine. <laughs> he was so excited. He felt like other artists had sort of already claimed other flowers um, or were known for painting different types of flowers. And, and he felt like I, I've landed on something here. For him, I, you know, I think a lot of people look at these pictures and they associate the yellow with happiness, with joy, with cheer. For him, it was gratitude. Doesn't that say so much about his heart? Now, he was working with his friend or frenemy, Paul Gauguin, at the time that he was producing uh, some of these sunflower paintings. And his friend, Gauguin, actually painted a portrait of Vincent van Gogh sitting at his easel with his paintbrush in hand with a, a bouquet of of, uh, or vase of sunflowers in front of him. And even Gauguin was like, oh God, you know, the, this is really working. You, you've landed on something here. He had a great appreciation for what Van Gogh was doing. Although Van Gogh really did not like this portrait of him. Of, he said, Gauguin made me look like a madman, which might've been the case at the time. <laughs> so um, he continues along, uh, he uh, uh, painting floral still lifes right up to almost the end of his life. Uh, several of the next few, or I, I guess the next two that I'm going to show you were done while he was, um, I believe he was living in the asylum when he painted this one. So uh, this was not the only uh, purple iris painting that he did while he was there, but it is an absolutely stunning version here. And I, you know, in addition to animating these petals in the same way that he did with the sunflowers, they, they have this um, liveliness, this vitality to them, this gorgeous color. And of course, we've got color theory at play with a work like this one too. We can see that this kind of golden yellow is just opposite the color wheel from the color of, of the irises themselves. There's just a tremendous satisfaction in looking at this. And I think that there's really something to the fact that he has this, this cluster of irises kind of falling out of the vase, spilling over. Otherwise, it would just be too simple and too neat, right? Um, he gives us a little something extra to wonder about. He reminds us that life is not perfect <laughs> in every way. Certainly his life wasn't perfect in every way. And I think um, it, it's just a, a really wonderful compositional choice to, to uh, sort of elongate and, and uh, the, the floral still life there and to have it spilling over. One last <clears throat> floral still life to share with you is, um, is one that he painted shortly before leaving the asylum. Notice how sort of loose and free those brush strokes are over here in the background. Uh, I think oftentimes they're interpreted as a sense of freedom. Like he, he knows that he's, he's going to be leaving. He knows that he's going to have a little bit more autonomy in his own life. With this pale green here, these roses actually had more pink in them originally. So this would have been another color theory painting for you. Um, but it's also another wonderful composition with the roses sort of spilling out of the vase again and leading us off of the edge 
of, of the frame here. So we can see he's found a solution. He is um, uh, uh, so adept at creating these compositions and finding these really wonderful ways to animate these, these, these petals and to uh, give these paintings so much vibrancy through his color choices. Let's see what he does when he turns his, um, his talents to landscapes. Just a quick note to say that I think once again, this background as a Dutch artist could have um, influenced a, a couple of his choices. I, I ran across this watercolor early on when I was doing research for uh, this, this program. This is a really early work for him in, in the early 1880s, but it reminded me of this historic Dutch landscape that is uh, here in Manchester, New Hampshire in my hometown, where we can see this kind of dead tree that has a new life kind of springing from it, the composition with figures on a path leading to a town in a dis in the distance. It just made me think that, oh, the, you know, he's he's probably got a good sense in terms of, of the art history here, but it it's really um, impressionist landscapes that he is primarily responding to. So we have an example of an impressionist landscape here by Alfred Sisley on the left. This was painted in 1875, and then an example of a landscape painted by Vincent van Gogh called The Harvest from 1888, so just over a decade later. Sisley's painting is all soft, isn't it? Don't you get a sense of just how loose his brushwork was, how much paint he sort of loaded up on his brush just to make all of these soft forms, the grasses in the, fo in the foreground, the trees, the fields, the clouds. Everything is different when we look over here at Vincent van Gogh on the right. Everything is sharp intentional and methodical. Sisley might have dashed this painting off in an afternoon or so. Vincent van Gogh probably worked on this, well, maybe for not much longer, but we really get a sense in terms of, of just how intentional every single brushstroke is and how he's variating um, uh, these brushstrokes depending on the color, depending on the form that he's actually painting here. Now his landscapes, um, are, are another opportunity for him to really showcase his incredible sense of color. This is called Peach Trees in Blossom from 1888. I just love how there's uh, some blue in the, in the road over here. It extends up through those peach trees to the mountains in the background um, to these short dashes of blue in the sky. This is just such a gorgeous painting. So satisfying to look like, look at. And uh, clearly we've arrived at his signature style now. I, I think most people would see a painting like this and, and easily be able to say, oh, I think that's, that's probably a Vincent van Gogh. Now we're gonna backtrack just for a moment because I think when it comes to landscapes, perhaps his, um, his model, his, um, his, his mentor in art, uh, Jean-Francois Millet, might have influenced where Vincent van Gogh goes next because we're looking at two Millet paintings here that are these sort of mysterious night scenes. There's something sort of dramatic happening in the sky, each of them. And Vincent van Gogh becomes <clears throat> really preoccupied with the idea of creating scenes at night. And so we, we, we have arrived now at two of his most famous paintings, The Cafe Terrace at Night from 1888 and Starry Night over Rhone uh, from the same year. So with these works, he wants the challenge of painting a sort of illumination at night, painting starry, uh, starry skies with the, this sort of dark or almost black night sky. So of course for him, it's all about color theory. This beautiful blue sky is exactly opposite this, um, this yellow cafe terrace over here. And then um, with the starry sky over the Rhone, over the river, we've got the opportunity to do all these reflections in the water. We've got these wonderful uh, sort of radiating halos around the stars, uh, sort of jumping back and forth here. I just love how, how, um, how he's using this uh, short kind of intentional, almost boxy brushwork in order to kind of separate the, the night sky from the stars in it. But for both of these, he is, he's coming so close. We've almost arrived at the ultimate solution for him, which I think is Starry Night. And once again, I have goosebumps because you can see that he's been working through some ideas. He gets to a picture and it's like everything 
clicks. Now, there's so much to say about The Starry Night, which is from 1889. It's in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. How lucky are we that it's in the United States? Now, this is a world famous painting. You could go anywhere, show them the picture. And not only would they know the name, they'd probably know the artist. When my son was in preschool at three years old, he knew Vincent Van Gogh and he knew Starry Night. This is such a familiar painting, but does anybody really know what this painting is actually about? <laughs> There's a lot of different ideas out there. They're all theories. Um, but I think part of the public fascination originally began with the fact that this was painted by Vincent van Gogh when he was living in an insane asylum. What does that say about this vision of the world? Was this how he saw the world? Or perhaps maybe this is the way we should see the world. So let's, let's sort of dive in here. Um, we'll just take it apart with what we see, first of all. Uh, this big sort of flame-like tree over here is a cypress tree. Cypress trees have a strong association with death. They were often planted in, um, in cemeteries and it serves as this tall framing device. If you think of like the rule of thirds in a picture, it sort of uh, uh, um, occupies one third of the picture. It's, it's in the foreground. It sort of leads us uh, a, a little ways into the middle ground. We've got this row of, of seemingly sort of humble houses taking our eye to the middle distance here where there is a church with this very tall steeple that I always think of as being like a needle. And it's like this needle that pierces the sky here. It's the connection between the foreground and, and the sky up above. Beyond that, we have these rolling hills that really look like ocean waves, don't they? I mean, you don't really see hills that look like that in that color very often. And then the night sky, which, um, which is almost as though we are looking at a galaxy itself with this swirling form right here in the center. Uh, images of galaxies or a galaxy that looked like this uh, in particular had already been published. Perhaps Vincent van Gogh was aware of it. Perhaps this is just him taking some artistic license. We already knew, know that he was experimenting with this idea of creating these halos around the stars like this. But in this case, there's, um, there's this incredible sense of movement from the landscape itself to the sense of atmosphere here um, and all of the, the short kind of pulsating brushstrokes that surround everything. In fact, I've, I've given this presentation in a lot of senior communities over the years and seniors in particular tell me that they can't really spend a lot of time looking at this work because it seems to pulsate for them. Maybe that's why it has this kind of hold on our popular imagination because maybe a painting like this moves a little bit more for us than, um, than your average painting. Now, um, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, astronomers have studied this painting and they've actually sort of uh, tried to determine the exact date that it was painted according to the formation of the stars and the moon in the sky. Um, I don't think that you have to break down this painting to, to get to, to the realism uh, behind it, the, the realism of, of, of when, or the realistic facts, the day-to-day -day facts of when was it painted and what does it firmly represent? Because, um, because this is an art, artistic expression. This is an interpretation of the world. Uh, I think it's important for us to note that this is not necessarily how, how Vincent van Gogh saw the world. Uh, he was looking at this scene or a similar scene through his windows at the, at the um, insane asylum, but he took artistic license and we know that he worked on this painting for several days. Uh, notice here that that church that he painted actually has a domed roof in the back. He decided not to include it. It certainly doesn't have as tall of a spire and we don't even see the hills <laughs> in the background. So, um, so he looked, he painted, he looked, he painted. This isn't an exact recording of what 
one madman saw looking out his window um, one night, uh, as romantic as that might be. Uh, different uh, historians and art historians have come to this painting with so many different ideas over the years. I just encountered one the other day by a really preeminent art historian who theorized that there's actually a woman giving birth in the stars here, that this is her crown, I suppose this is her breast, and maybe somewhere in here in the swirl is a pregnant belly or, and a child emerging. Um, but one of the things that actually somebody in the audience of one of my presentations noted to me was that in all of this kind of swirling formation in the sky here, what we actually have right at the center is a knot. So even though there's this looseness, there's this freedom, this is something that's kind of swirling in on itself. There's almost a sense of paralysis here, which would certainly make sense for a man who was in an, in an asylum, um, institutionalized while he created this, uh, feeling stuck. Uh, so uh, not to dedicate too much time to this, but I also just wanted to show you how thickly this painting is painted. You almost get the sense that he squeezed uh, the paint out of paint tubes in order to accomplish something like this. If you're interested in looking at it up close and personal, I uh, absolutely recommend going to moma.org in order to, you, you can get up close and rotate the canvas around. It's really fun and exciting. So just a few more landscapes that I wanted to briefly show you before we, we finish up with the famous story of the year and some portraits. We have um, just a few more sort of beautiful celestial events happening in pictures like this. Notice. We've got a couple in the foreground, one with a red hair and beard, which you could certainly interpret as a self-portrait of the artist. Once again, very poignant because he didn't necessarily have somebody to go out on strolls with. So um, as we get closer to the end of his life, the end of his career, Vincent van Gogh's skies get really dark. It's, it's like this horrible foreshadowing for what's to come. It's this beautiful though, indigo, indigo blue. It sort of haunts me. And this church at Auvers that he painted uh, the month before he passed away seems to have a life all its own. It's almost like the sunflowers all over again. I always imagine that this church could sort of get up and walk away sort of like a spider. There's just a lot of, of um, movement, the suggestion of movement in the, in the way that he constructed it here. One of his very last landscapes is this one called Wheatfield with Crows. This was probably done within weeks of his death. And we can see that his brushstrokes are wild at this point. We've gone so far away from like the control that we saw in, in the garden path as we, as we set out the, uh, this afternoon. These are big, wide, wild brush strokes and of course a dark sky here and this sense of a disturbance with the crows flying up out of the wheat it's um it's a really ominous painting if you've seen the movie by any chance i have not called lust for life starring kirk douglas this is back from 1956 he was painting in the movie this specific painting when um when he, I, I believe he was like attacked by crows <laughs> and maybe that was um, maybe that was the the end of his life as well. That is um, that is sort of apocryphal. That is not how it happened. We actually don't know what he was painting the day that he was shot. So um, let's finish up really quickly with portraits and then the ear. Now, Vincent van Gogh only had close relationships with a few people in his life. So he would go back to them again and again as um, subjects in his paintings, if not um, uh, models for him. I think sometimes he just went back to the same painting again. So the the figure that we're looking at in these three pictures is a man by the name of Père Tanguay, and he made sense for uh, Vincent van Gogh to have a friendship with because he owned an art supply store. So within the space of uh, a year, Vincent van Gogh goes from painting kind of a naturalistic portrait of Père Tanguay, very traditional, um, with the figure looking off uh, at, a, at this diagonal here, not uh, directly confronting us uh, frontally, which would have been, which is really sort of out of line with the history of art. But then as Vincent van Gogh becomes more comfortable and becomes more, um, more established with his own uh, style and approach to painting, we can see that his evolution and his approach to his, his art dealer friend, our art, art supply dealer friend, uh, it becomes uh, much more 
post-impressionist. We can see those really uh, intentional brushstrokes defining the entire work. We can also see that Pere Tengue shared his appreciation for Japanese woodblock prints. So he surrounds him with those. Another figure that Vincent van Gogh goes back to again and again is the wife of his mailman. Um, this is a painting that he called La Bercuse, which is essentially a, like the lullaby. And in this case, this woman, who we can see in five different forms here, is holding onto a rope that would have been attached to a cradle. So this is a woman who was rocking a baby to sleep as she, at least when she initially uh, um, sat for Vincent van Gogh. So I, I, as I look at these, I would imagine that he created one painting and then, um, and then just replicated it and used it as an opportunity to explore color theory here, making her face, I think, increasingly greener and greener. <laughs> so with these works, once again, it's somebody who was kind of within his inner circle. And this, what, this is another work that always kind of pulls at my heartstrings too, because th this was painted shortly after the artist mutilated his ear. So this, this sense of comfort of rocking a child to sleep, um, I, I think probably would have had um, a greater significance in his life at the time. Now, after Vincent van Gogh leaves the asylum, he lives independently for a couple of months, but he is under the care of a doctor that his brother connects him with, uh, Dr. Gachet. <coughs> Excuse me. So Dr. Gachet was looking after Vincent van Gogh and, um, and when Vincent van Gogh first met him, he was like despondent because he could see that Dr. Gachet, who was also an artist and who was prone to melancholy himself, he felt like there's no way that this person could help me. He, and he wrote to his brother that he felt like it was the blind leading the blind. But eventually the two men uh, established a, a, a good friendship and a good working relationship. But he creates this... Um, it's like the ultimate portrait of a melancholy figure, right? Leaning on your arm, sort of looking off into the distance mournfully, these two versions here. I believe the first version sold for close to a um, million dollars back in 1990. It's the equivalent of 158 million today. Uh, it was one of those kind of... Uh, huge surprises in the art market where we really began to see uh, Vincent van Gogh's uh, work kind of taking traction, getting traction in the art market and get fetching in ever increasingly higher prices. So when it comes to portraits, Vincent van Gogh, like other Dutch artists before him, like Vincent, uh, like uh, Rembrandt over here, decides that uh, painting yourself is probably a great way to, uh, to practice and to prove yourself as an artist. So once again, sort of following in this Dutch tradition, this is a really, uh, a fairly early self-portrait uh, with, uh, with the pipe and, and the red beard. And we're going to see over the course of just the next few images, how dramatically Vincent van Gogh changes, uh, at least in terms of his artistic interpretations of himself. The following year, he paints himself as an artist, working at a canvas, uh, paints in hand, and, um, and sort of looking healthy. He looks like his face is full. He looks like he's eating well. This, is, this corresponds to that period where he's been living with his brother. He looks like the young man that we saw in like one of those only, one of, like the only authenticated photograph that we have of Vincent van Gogh. Here he is about 34 years old. And I think there's tremendous pride in who he is as an artist here. There's, there's still a lot of innovation in the painting itself. We see those, those short brush strokes, very intentional in terms of their direction and their, their size and their shape. He's working with color theory. There's some blue and some orange here, but I love the little details. The, he's included some red and some green in his hair, and that only gets more dramatic. Look at what he is doing in um, over the course of the next year. The brush strokes get bigger, they get bolder, the, um, the, the integration of, uh, of 
of anti-naturalistic color, I think is really wild here. It's almost as though he has uh, like animal-like qualities. Every time I look at these images, I feel like I'm looking at a lion, <laughs> but he is, he's using uh, these sort of wild brushstrokes on his skin, not just for, to describe his, his beard and his hair. And the detail that I just love here is that he's using like orange and yellow stripes all the way down his nose here. And then cross hatching them with some yellow too. It, I mean, this is a really wild way to paint yourself. So he's being experimental in his color choices and in his brushwork. Um, add to that this, this highly animated background too. And these pictures really kind of knock your socks off. And then it leads us to this work, which seems like a surprise in, in response to it. This is from um, about a year later. Uh, Vincent van Gogh painted this when he was at the asylum. And I think you can once again, get that sense of constriction in a picture like this, even though we have that kind of free floating swirling background here and the same color palette to describe his clothes. You almost get the sense of somebody in like a straight jacket, somebody who feels so compressed and um and restrained here and there's certainly a sense of um of melancholy in in the face but it's this next self-portrait which always knocks my socks off this is uh, such a dramatic picture and he has changed so much when you see this picture this was also done while he was at the asylum um, this corresponds to those dark landscapes with the dark blue sky look at how emaciated he is he doesn't look like himself at all you wouldn't guess that uh, that was the same young man um, this was done uh, just the year before he passed away but there is uh, certainly a direct and intimacy here. He's once again showing us, presenting himself as an artist here. There's pride in that identity, but there is also um, sort of a, a new kind of melancholy, a new kind of pathos in, in the brushwork. It doesn't have that same sense of rigor. You sort of get the sense that that, that is sort of slipping away for, from him or slipping out of his control. The very last self-portrait I wanted to share with you is also from 1889, and we can see that he's just shaved his beard here. He actually even included little cuts on his face. So when he passed away, he didn't have his signature red beard. He would have been probably unrecognizable to, to many of us. Um, but it's, it's so interesting to see this last look of him before his death. So let's wrap up. <laughs> I know we're at four o'clock right now. So very quickly with the story of the famous ear, what actually happened there? So Vincent van Gogh decided that became sort of fixated on this idea of starting an art artist commune in the south of France, free from the corruption of the city. But who wants to go live with somebody who was as erratic as Vincent van Gogh? His brother essentially pays the artist Paul Gauguin to travel to Arles, France, and live in this little yellow house painted here by Vincent van Gogh uh, to start this artist commune. And this is incidentally where Vincent's bedroom was when he was living with Paul Gauguin right before the ear incident. Um, so Paul Gauguin and Vincent van Gogh create these self-portraits of themselves. They exchange them in advance of living together. And over the course of the next nine weeks, I believe it was, they have a, a, an incredibly productive artistic relationship, but they are also, um, they're roommates and that's not going so well for them. Uh, I, I remember reading it at one point uh, from one historian that, that said essentially Vincent van Gogh didn't have an off switch. And so when he got excited about things, like he couldn't calm down. And this uh, began to, to really wear away at their relationship. One night they quarreled and apparently, uh, 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 Gauguin left the house very angry and apparently Vincent van Gogh ran out after him brandishing a razor but then ran back into the house. Gauguin returned to the house in the morning and found Vincent van Gogh with his ear severed um, lying in a pool of blood close to death. 
he called the authorities and he got on a train and the two artists never saw each other again. There's an interesting detail that comes from the news reports at the time. I have the, um, the translation here that says, um, last Sunday at 1130 in the evening, Vincent Van Gogh, a painter of Dutch origin, called at the brothel number one, asked for a woman called Rachel and handed her dot, 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 his ear saying, guard this object with your life. Then he disappeared when informed of the action, which could only be that of a pitiful madman. The police went the next day to his house and discovered him lying on his bed, apparently at the point of death. The unfortunate man has been rushed to the hospital. Now I will say over the years, I have read so many many conflicting reports about what was actually cut. I grew up thinking, probably like everybody else here, that the entire ear was cut off. And then I read somewhere along the ways that it was just a little piece of his earlobe. And then I read it was the top, it was the bottom. Well, I finally nailed this down because we have the drawing from his doctor to show exactly what was severed. And apparently even Paul Gauguin was fairly impressed that it was a very clean, um, clean cut. So that brings us, of course, to the famous portraits, uh, uh, self portraits with the bandaged ear. This was Vincent van Gogh actually really trying to show his doctors how well he was doing, that he was taking care of his wound, that he was taking care of himself, wearing a hat, wearing a coat. Um, these were attempts to, to, um, to show that he was um, doing okay. Now there is an alternative theory out there that maybe Vincent van Gogh did not do this to himself, that maybe in his fight with Paul Gauguin, Paul Gauguin did this to him. And, and Vincent van Gogh just being um, uh, maybe more uh, uh, compassionate, more forgiving than the average person would have said, you know, I'll just take the blame for this. We do know that after Gauguin left on a train, he went and he made this self-portrait with a bloody missing ear. Um, it's a really sort of uh, startling and, and disturbing vessel that he created in response to that experience. He created a number of works in response to his time with Vincent van Gogh. It's fascinating. So of course, all of this leads to um, Vincent van Gogh's time in the asylum. He spends about a year there. You can go and visit it. Um, this was his room, his accommodations. It was actually um, not a cramp. It was not a bad place to be. There were other patients there, but it was um, almost empty. <laughs> so you can see these empty hallways that he painted. And when he got there, he took up the subject of the iris and, uh, you know, always the poignant white iris over here. And he apparently said that it was, this painting was like a lightning rod for his mental illness. If he just kept working on it, he felt like he would be okay. This is another painting that I think sort of shocked the art market initially in 1987. It sold for what was at the time a huge sum, sum of money, uh, 59 point or $53.9 million. It was the highest price ever paid for a work of art at auction. Of course, that number has been blown away in, um, in recent years. So, um, so very quickly, his death, his legacy, Vincent van Gogh, uh, was released from the asylum. He was under the care of Dr. Gachet and he was living in a little inn here above a cafe in Auvers, France, just outside of Paris. He, um, he went out one day to paint in a field. This is not the painting that he did on the day that he died, but this was done about two weeks prior. And um, instead of coming home at dusk or back to the inn at dusk, he arrived at around 9 p.m. and he was clutching his abdomen. He had been shot in the abdomen and he said, I did this to myself. It was a long, excruciating 36-hour death. Dr. Gachet was called to his side. They, his brother Theo was able to make it to his side as well. There was no surgeon available to remove the bullet. And, and he said to Dr. Gachet, apparently, you know, it's, it's okay that there's nobody to remove the bullet because then I would have to do it all over again. According um, to his brother, Vincent's last words were, the sadness will last forever, which is just absolutely heartbreaking. This is Dr. Gachet's rendering of Vincent van Gogh on his deathbed. I'm not 
quite sure what to make of that ear right there. This is in the collection of the Art Institute of Chicago. Six months after Vincent van Gogh passed away, his younger brother passed away for, uh, due to uh, syphilis. And it was really his younger brother's wife and their son, also named Vincent, who protected Vincent van Gogh's legacy and um, you know, uh, made sure the, the, the papers were preserved and, and helped to sort of advocate for his reputation after his death. Uh, in recent years, there has been the theory put out there that perhaps Vincent van Gogh was not, did not um, take his own life, that instead perhaps he was accidentally or maybe on purpose murdered. There was a group of teenagers apparently living in Auvers that were kind of bullying him. One of them had sort of an unreliable gun. There could have been a conf confrontation in, in the field. And um, and we just will never know. Uh, this was put out in the book, Vincent van Gogh, The Life from 2011. A gun was discovered in that field only in 1960. It was recently auctioned off for close to $200,000. $200, we don't even know if it was the gun. What we do know is that Vincent van Gogh and his artwork is sort of infused in our everyday life now. We all probably own something or purchased something with a Vincent van Gogh painting on it in some way. And part of that is because these paintings are beautiful and they still bring us joy. It makes it especially sad when you see these jokes about his ear being severed and we forget that he was an actual person who was you know, experiencing so much misery. He was, he was really suffering and it's become this kind of awful punchline. Today, we, we know that people are flocking to see as much Vincent van Gogh as possible. There are the Van Gogh immersive experiences where you can uh, walk through the paintings and floor to ceiling projections. There's the Loving Vincent uh, movie from 2018 that has like 65,000 individually hand painted frames. So every single frame of the painting or frame of the movie looks like a Vincent van Gogh painting. And then there's the Vincent van Gogh Museum it's one of the top visited museums in the world. And if you just go by museums dedicated to a single artist, it is the most visited museum in the world. People can't get enough of Vincent van Gogh. A hundred years after he created this portrait of his postman, it was purchased by the Museum of Modern Art for the equivalent of $123 million in today's money. In fact, if you go to um, the list of the most expensive paintings in the world, 10 of Vincent van Gogh's paintings are there and together they're worth more than a billion dollars. All this from the artist who only sold one painting during his entire lifetime. I think it's beyond remarkable that, that his work has survived in this way and that we should all be grateful that Van Gogh's short tortured life produced so much enduring beauty and still brings us so much joy today. So I will end there. I'm sorry I went a little bit late, but Vincent Van Gogh deserves it. And I will start looking at the chat and any questions people might have about Vincent Van Gogh. Here. I'm while Jane's looking at that. This is Dana again in Rockport. I would like to say thank you, Jane, as always, being so um, thorough and um, engaging, as well as um, just interested in your subject matter, and it clearly shows. Um, so thank you. So you're going to go through. Um, the next, um, the series of questions that you're looking at, correct? All right, yes. Um, let's see here. We have, oh, uh, Mira says, the stars remind me of the ceiling lights in his garage work for the bar. Yes, absolutely. We had the night cafe before, which sort of had those uh, eyeball-like uh, uh, lights that seem to sort of radiate or have an aura around them. And the stars have that too. But Victoria notes that um, the stars look like they might align with the Big Dipper, uh, but really nothing else kind of works there. Mira, thanks for your kind words. Rosamond adds that the Starry Night painting looks like a swirling firmament, which I think has biblical meaning too. I'm not that familiar with that, Rosamond, but that's an interesting thread. Now I'm going to have to look into that. Uh, Susan saw the uh, traveling exhibit in Detroit recently, said it was great. Uh, Mira says that last self-portrait is so sad. 
I'm surprised there's no documentation about his illness and treatment. There is, there is a book about his time at the asylum. There's somebody who went through as much of the documentation that was there as possible. Uh, you really get a sense of what it was like for Vincent living there. And what kind of breaks my heart is that his brother was only about 15 miles away, I think, but never visited him during that, that, that year there. So I think it was a particularly difficult year. And we do have letters from um, back and forth between Theo and the director of the asylum about Vincent's condition. There were a couple of very low points for him while he was there, but it seemed like for the most part, he was in a, a, a good place. Uh, Marie says another theory that Van Gogh suffered from uh, tinnitus, which would have caused him to cut off his ear due to the ringing maybe. Oh, oh. that's an interesting theory. Um, uh, perhaps that's the case. I think that's caused by... Um, well, I, I don't know what it's caused by, but I do know that that's like the, the consistent uh, uh, ringing in your ear. That's an interesting idea. Um, Kathy says sort of in regards to the idea of, um, of, of Vincent van Gogh sort of uh, taking the blame or the fault, whether it was uh, Vincent van Gogh taking the blame for Gauguin, maybe cutting his ear or kids who had shot him. You never know. I, I sort of gravitated towards that theory for a long time because he just seemed like such a compassionate soul. Like he wouldn't want to get anybody else in trouble. Okay, somebody shot me, but I'll take the blame. Somebody cut me, but I'll take the blame. But really there were a lot of negative reports about his behavior when he was living in the little house. I mean, there was like a petition from the neighborhood to get him out of there because his behavior was so out of the norm. Um, so, so both things could be true simultaneously, but I think he was a, a, a pretty sick person. Um, hoping to see the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. That's on my bucket list, Dorothy. I hope I can go. I hope you can go. Um, the, uh, Marnie says, please tell us about the next program in February. Oh, it's a great one. Okay, so devilish details and, and sacred symbols. So everybody here has probably read the, the Da Vinci Code at one point or the other. What's wrong with the Da Vinci Code is that Dan Brown was trying to uh, apply all, all this meaning to symbols that weren't even necessarily there. But he was just looking at the wrong period, the wrong time, because if he'd been looking at the early Northern Renaissance, it's just a filled with symbols. Everything has symbolic meaning. And we're going to delve into the symbols in these paintings. Some of them refer to things that are holy. Sometimes there's just like little devils crawling out of everything. It's a, it's a really fun program because we're going to get like microscopically close to these pictures and really uh, delve into what every element means there. Lee, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, Victoria says, what kind of paint was Van Gogh using? I, I believe it was all oil painted for the most part. I think I showed one watercolor. Um, CG, thank you for your kind words. You too, Mary Lou. Um, Jan, it, well now, it, okay, now my head's just getting really big going through this. Thank you everybody for spending your afternoon with me. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you, Jane, as always, and thank you for answering all the questions. I've got one. Um, you had mentioned that he only sold one painting. And so was it necessarily that that type of artwork wasn't revered then? Is it um, uh, he didn't try to sell many paintings? What, what was the reason for that? Um, that is a really good question, Dana, because now that you're making me think about it in a whole new way. And I mean, he's got a brother who's an art dealer. So you'd think that there would be a little bit of extra push there. Um, I think that he was still pretty avant-garde. I mean, he was like rubbing elbows with the avant-garde in Paris while he was living there, but he was still sort of on the edge of that. He wasn't fully integrated into, into um, the art scene yet. And I, I, I have a feeling he was just, you know, in the margins still. So maybe he hadn't quite been discovered. Um, it certainly seems to me that some of his best work was produced uh, just before his death while he was living in an asylum and in the months after that. So I'm not sure that that work had really even been seen yet. I think he was actually gearing up for an exhibition that he was pretty excited about, but you know, he was just up and down in, in the weeks leading up to his death. I mean, he was writing to his brother that he felt like 
an absolute failure and that he saw no happy future for himself. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it's really, I, I mean, if you wanted to sort of go back and forth, was he murdered, but did he take his own life? It's, it's really hard to go by what he was writing because his letters to his brother were, were really up and down at that time. But mm -hmm. the question of, of, you know, why only one picture, I think is, is a very good one. I, I, one thing that I'm really curious too, is if he wasn't selling these 900 paintings, where were they? <laughs> um, certainly his, um, his sister-in-law and his nephew had a huge role in the formation of the museum. But I mean, all of that took decades to, to, to happen. So it's, it's really interesting to think about where everything was and how exactly it was preserved too. Hmm. Um, let's see, did his did he write his brother in Dutch or in French? Shelly, that's a really good question. Um, I <laughs> we could go back to the to the letters really quickly. Um, offhand, I don't know. I let's see here. Oof. I think that's Dutch. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I think that's Dutch. If anybody can make that out, let me know. Um, the, the letters have been published and translated if you're interested in going through those now. Where is Starry Night now? Um, it's at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Um, Kara says, I'm filled with a great sense of sadness and empathy for this man. Kara, if I could help you feel that way, I, I'm actually honored because I, I do feel like too much these days, it's like we, he's, he's a joke, you know, um, or the, the story of it, his ear is a joke, but he so clearly cared for other people and felt things so deeply and created so much beauty for us that we still enjoy. I feel like our heart should be with him. Um, I'm just going through these questions. Thank you everybody for these kind words. I think I got to everything. Um, I've got another question about the bedroom, because um, that is one of my favorite ones. It it has a susical feeling to it. Um, and if you notice, one of the portraits on the wall, I think, is a, his self-portrait. Yeah. Um, and we don't see anything else with this. I don't know anything about art, but I'm going to say at this angle, this sort of closing in if you will do you, do you know anything to comment on that because if and this may be just one of the only ones if you say he's produced 900 pieces i've not seen 900 pieces but this is the only one that i've seen that has that walls squeezing in feeling so right. um right so the perspective's totally off here right? <laughs> <Thank you. Yeah. laughs> and um and it makes it feel like the bed is much bigger as it gets towards us than you know at where the pillows are makes it feel like that bed could sort of get up and move around too um the distortion in terms of the perspective could have been a specific choice on his part i'm just looking at the way like he's rendered the table here which is rendered as though the perspective is right. Um, it could have been a choice, but this also, I've never been to this building and offhand, I'm not entirely sure it still exists. Maybe somebody has been on that tour. That's another bucket list tour to take uh, uh, Van Gogh in the South of France. But this actually might be a room, I think I remember reading, that did have a sort of odd shape to it. I'm not, don't quote me on that, but that might actually be true. Mm -hmm. So it could have been an artistic choice, Dana, or it could have been sort of a reflection of, of a little bit of strange architecture here. Uh, <clears throat> I will say, I'm trying to think of like other interior spaces that he painted offhand and if, and if they all have um, a similar distortion to them, but you're right. The, the one, one that you showed um, uh, of the, um, the bar, um, was much more normalized. Um, um, yeah, it was fairly early on that a lot of red and yellow. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but that pool table is a lot like that bed, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it feels as though it's on an angled floor. Yeah. And now yeah. looking at the floorboards, it does have a sense of angle, doesn't it? It absolutely does. Yeah. It absolutely yeah. does. So, I mean, he's self-taught, so it's hard to say, you know, did he just not understand perspective or is this a, a, an artistic choice? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it does. I, I don't know. It, it, it's really hard to say. I, like looking at this tabletop right here, that really seems <laughs> like, 
<laughs> like somebody who doesn't understand perspective, but, um, but it's hard to say because I mean, there's certainly, uh, like if we looked at the night cafe, uh, there's exaggerations there, but you don't really get the sense that, um, that he doesn't understand perspective. I mean, you get a great sense of linear perspective here. The tabletops don't look like they're tipping forward. So it's, it's, yeah, maybe this is just the result of practice. <laughs> it's hard to say Dana, but you've touched on a really interesting thread there. Yeah. Um, and then of course somebody says maybe it was the drink that was affecting his perception. I, I, I see that too. Yes. <laughs> well, Jane, as always, it's, it's one of my favorite Sundays is to spend it with you. And uh, once again, you don't disappoint and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Um, thank you, Marnie, for being such a gracious co-host and putting all the information for next month's in the chat. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you, Jane. So thank I, I you as always. And again, I'll thank everybody for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye everyone. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Good afternoon.